so that he could have relationship with us. He didn't just create us so that he'd have somebody uh, to boss around. He created us for relationship. <clears throat> and relationships, again, as most of you know, particularly if you have children, relationships are measured in time. They're based on time. <clears throat> and some people in the course of their relationships do some really, really um, strange things. I'm thinking of Chuck in Berlin just now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> these people, talking about relationships, took their family while their kids were small, sold their house, left their work, decided they'd go trekking through Europe for six months with backpacks and stuff. I... <laughs> Building relationships and memories. So when we talk about time, both the quality of the time and the quantity of the time are important when we're building our relationships. God gave us this gift of time one-seventh of every week. Not that the other six days we're not building a relationship with God, we're not praying, we're not doing other things. And this is one of the arguments that people use. Well, I, I worship God every day. I pray to God every day. Well, that's wonderful. So do I. But God made a special day. He made that day, and he made it for us, and he gave it to us as a gift. So even though, yes, I worship God every day, I pray every day, I've even taken lately to singing to God. He's got to be the only being that would enjoy listening to me sing. <laughs> Occasionally, Carol has to tolerate it, but she's not the target. So she just ignores me, hopefully, anyway. But God did something very special for us, and he gave us a very special day. He didn't just give it to Seventh-day Adventists. He gave it to the world, the whole world. It's a gift, unfortunately, that most of the world ignores and rejects. And, and in some cases, the rejection is based on false information. Because if everyone knew the beauty and the joy that God intended for us for this, on this day, no one would reject it. I don't think. It's just it's lack of meaningful information or a desire or a pull of the world to distract or detract from the goodness and the blessings that God has made for us. Now, part of the problem with Sabbath keeping is it's associated with the Old Covenant, with the Jews, and with what is often called legalism in that that is somehow a legalistic approach to a relationship with God. Now, please note that that is the only commandment that those aspersions are cast upon. It's not, a, it's not legalism to not kill people. It's not legalism to not be a thief. It's not legalism to honor your marriage vows. But when it comes to the fourth commandment, too often we hear this issue of legalism and old covenant, Sinai. Well, the Sabbath 
didn't originate at Mount Sinai, nor were any of the other commandments started at Mount Sinai. The commandments of God are a reflection of his very heart. And his character is revealed to us in the statutes that he gave to us to follow. He didn't do that just to show that he was in charge. He did it for our benefit. So we have a wonderful oasis in time called the Sabbath. Now clearly, it has been tainted. And a lot of that is a function of what happened when the Jews came out of Babylonian captivity. They were 70 years in captivity in Babylon. Why were they there? Well, they, had, they were worshiping idol gods. They were shedding innocent blood. They were rejecting the God of heaven. They were trampling on his Sabbath. They all... Every, they were just, they had become total and complete idolaters. And so when God let them go into Babylonian captivity for 70 years, when they came back, after that 70-year captivity in Babylon, you never once hear again of the Jews worshiping idols. You don't hear again of idols being in the courtyard of the, of the sanctuary. All of that happened before, but now they decided that they're going to make sure that we get this thing right. Unfortunately, what they did is they started laying their own opinions on God's law. And they took the Sabbath because they had been breaking the, before they went into captivity, they broke the, they broke all of God's laws. So they wanted to make sure that no one breaks the Sabbath again. They made up over 700 rules about Sabbath keeping. And they added that to the commandment, and that was not God's intention at all. God clearly lays out in Exodus chapter 20 what he desires, but they made up a bunch of rules. One of them was, for example, you couldn't walk more than 500 yards on the Sabbath day. That was called the Sabbath day's journey. You couldn't carry a burden. If you could pick up a burden, pick up a look with one hand, you could carry it. But if it took two hands, you couldn't do it. Breaking the law, the Sabbath. You couldn't write more than two letters of the alphabet on the Sabbath. You couldn't tie a knot and loosen it on the Sabbath. They made up these rules because they wanted to make sure nobody broke the Sabbath. But by doing it, they were desecrating the Sabbath because they added something that wasn't there. kind of like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, God told Adam that he should not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, when the Satan tempted Eve, here's what Eve said to him. God says we should not eat of this tree, nor should we touch it. There was nothing in God's instructions about touching the tree. God's instruction was, don't eat the fruit. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us this explicitly, but the commandment that God gave was given to Adam. It wasn't given to Eve. So Adam, hearing it, here's Eve. This is just my supposition. He adds something to it. Don't eat of that tree and don't touch that tree. Now when the temptation comes, how easy would it be for the devil to say, God says don't touch the tree, touch the tree. See, nothing happens. Here's the fruit. 
What difference does it make if you eat from this tree or any of the other trees? See, they're all the same. This tree is the same. So now the hook is there and she eats. Then Adam comes along, oh my, and he chooses to follow Eve rather than follow God. But sin did not enter the world through Eve. Sin entered the world through Adam. She was deceived. He made a choice. So they added all these things to the law, the Sabbath commandment. But Jesus told us this in Mark 2, 27. And he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The Jews had turned it around like God made man so he would have someone to keep the Sabbath. But man was made first and then the Sabbath was made afterwards. It was given as a gift so that we could celebrate it. It was not meant to be a chore so that we could have all these rules to observe on the Sabbath day. So we want to follow some biblical principles for Sabbath keeping because they are, there are biblical principles. And today I'm going to very quickly go through eight of them and you can get the same information on our sheet that's out there when you leave, and you can take it and study it. The first principle of keeping the Sabbath or having a joyful Sabbath is resting. Resting physically, emotionally, spiritually, and mentally. In the Sabbath commandment, Exodus chapter 20, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to read a few texts today. You might want to follow along. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11. He says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. Now, please note, he says, not only you, but your children and your servants, those who are working for you, and even down to the animals. Then he goes on and says, for verse 11, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. In other words, he made it holy. He sanctified it for a holy purpose. The basic principle that we are to work six days and rest on the seventh day is a God-created, God-given principle. And some scientists have even discovered that man's being, that we function best on this seven-day cycle. That when you work six days and you rest the seventh day, you are a much better person, just in a human, physical, mental state. You are made better simply by following this commandment. Now, not only if you read the commandment correctly, not only do we rest and not do work on the Sabbath, we do not enable other people to work on the Sabbath. I've been in churches where the people will get out of church and they go to a restaurant to eat on the Sabbath day. You all go ahead, but my Bible says you nor your servant, your female servant or your male servant. If you go to a restaurant on the Sabbath, 
and you're paying someone to serve you, you are enabling them to break God's commandment. We don't buy and sell on the Sabbath. We don't enable other people to work on the Sabbath when we wouldn't be quote-unquote working ourselves. If I'm enabling someone to do something, I am doing the same thing. Am I not? So we don't enable employees of establishment. We do not go shopping on the Sabbath. I was doing a meeting in Salem, Oregon, and um, among other things, a brother had some real issues. He was wanting to be baptized, but I don't baptize people just because they say, I want to be baptized. I baptize them because they've surrendered their lives to Jesus, and they've decided to follow Jesus. Well, he had his own thing about Sabbath keeping. You know, he could go hunting and fishing and chopping wood and all this other stuff. I, well, you know, that's not keeping Sabbath. But I feel close to God when I'm doing that. We don't go by our feelings. <laughs> we go by our faith. And our faith always leads us to obey what God says. If you go shopping on Sabbath... You're enabling other people to break God's commandments. If you're going to restaurants on Sabbath, paying for your food, you're enabling other people to break God's commandment. I'm not going to be an enabler of people to break God's commandment. Many people are sick and worn out because all of their working lives, they've ignored God's principle. It is not uncommon for corporate executives who basically work seven days a week, 14, 16-hour days, trying to keep these large corporations making more money, and they die in their early 50s because they have worked themselves to death. Principle number one is resting. Principle number two is worship. Leviticus chapter 23 verse 3 says, Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work in it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. The Lord asks his people to come together for a holy convocation, a gathering of the people of God for this sacred purpose. Paul admonishes the church in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another as so much the more as you see the day approaching. So it's proper, it's biblical, it's a direction of God for us to come together for a holy convocation on Sabbath. Jesus had a custom of going to church on Sabbath. Luke 4.16 says, so, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The apostle Paul gathered with the church for worship on Sabbath. Several texts says that. I'm not going to read them all. Acts 13, 42. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them on the next Sabbath. Now some people, <clears throat> particularly Sunday keepers, will say there is no place in the New Testament where you see the church kept Sabbath. I think, what Bible are you reading? I'm serious. There are people that would... I saw this... I, I saw a, a, a debate on TV. We got this one Adventist and another uh, uh, non-Adventist scholar trying to show from the Bible that you don't have to keep the Sabbath. 
that is something made up and contrived. What Bible are you reading? There is nothing in the New Testament, if you want to be truthful about it, that supports Sunday keeping. I can show you lots of texts in the, in the New Testament that the church gathered on Sabbath. And the other, the other thing is, <clears throat> what people don't understand is that there, there was no issue in the New Testament church about keeping Sabbath. There weren't a bunch of people saying, well, we should keep Sunday, we should keep Sabbath, we should keep another day. That wasn't an issue. Everybody kept Sabbath. It was understood. In fact, most of these people were Jews in the first place. And then it wasn't until the Gentiles came in. But, and when the Gentiles came in, they just started flowing with the church. The church met and celebrated as God said he called a holy convocation in the Apostle Paul. They said, well, he only went to the synagogue because that's where the Jews gathered, but, but the Gentiles weren't there. Well, in the verse I just read, it says, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them on the next Sunday. Is that what it said? No, on the next Sabbath. And then it says, on the next Sabbath, almost a whole city came together to hear the word of God. If Paul was having church services on Sunday, for goodness sake, he would have said, okay, I talked to these Jews over here on Sabbath. You and I will meet on the real Lord's Day, which is Sunday. Just come back tomorrow. <laughs> they had church on Sabbath. There are several others for the sake of time. I won't read. They're all in the handouts out there, so you can read those. The Lord tells us that we're going to gather for Sabbath worship in the new heavens and the new earth. I stood up one day in a Pentecostal church, Sunday keeping. They invited me, of all people, to preach a sermon on Sunday. <laughs> And I stood up and I said, and I read this text from Isaiah, Isaiah 66, 23. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. It shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come and worship before me, says the Lord. And so I told them, if you're going to be keeping Sabbath in the new earth, in the new heavens, you better start practicing for it now. <laughs> they never invited me back. <laughs> Honestly, they never did. You see, there is a dynamic to corporate worship and group work. That's why I call a holy conv convocation where all of God's people come together. There's a dynamic in this setting that's different from individual or private worship. Sure, we pray during the week. Sure, we worship God during the week. But the church that worships together particularly on God's holy day, we receive this blessing together. Now, the same thing is true for prayer, by the way. There is a dynamic that is achieved in corporate prayer when the church comes together to pray that you don't get when you're praying by yourself. You should pray by yourself. You should worship God by yourself. But you should come together so that the church can come together and pray together. That's the model of the early church. And they came together and they worshiped on Sabbath. Principle number three. I got to hurry now. I'm almost out of time. Celebrate the creation of God and remember his wonderful acts. Genesis 2.1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested 
on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now please note that God didn't set apart the seventh day until after he himself rested in it. Do you think God was tired? You don't? You don't think he was worn out, bone tired, and had to take a day off? And he invites us to celebrate with him because he knows that we do get bone tired and we need a day of rest. So he set that day aside and he gave it to man as a gift. Principle number four, the Sabbath is a time for family togetherness. Now, God created Adam and Eve on the sixth day. That means that the very first full day of their being together was Sabbath. God has this time for families to be together. Families, you see, are under attack today. And throughout the week, kids are going to school and mom and dad are often going to work. And in those environments, you're being assailed. And the very fabric of family life is being attacked, challenged, and the enemy is doing his best to destroy it. But Sabbath is a time for families to come together and be renewed together. And we should take advantage of that. (laughs) Principle number five. Humanitarianism, that's really just a big word for saying doing good to benefit other people. To minister to the physical needs of people. When you, when you assist people who are in need on the Sabbath day, you are not violating a principle of God. You are living out the very essence of of what God's heart desires. Let's look at a couple of texts here where Jesus demonstrated this in Matthew 12, 11 and 12. And he said to them, what man is there among you who has one sheep and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then in John 5, verses 5 through 9, Jesus sees this man who has an infirmity. He had this infirmity for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man said, sir... I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise up, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately, the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. Now, the Jews, the first thing they asked this man, what are you doing carrying that bed? Here's a man who's been laying, lame, unable to do anything for 38 years. And then people see him walking instead of them rejoicing. They're saying, what are you doing carrying that bed? (laughs) Who told you to do that? Is that a work mine or what? Jesus did good on the Sabbath. They had made all these rules. You couldn't see that was unlawful. He's carrying a bed. It's a Sabbath day. But Jesus said, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Principle number six is missionary work. That is, well, let's read the text here of Matthew 12, 5. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? The Priests in the temple 
are doing a lot of things that if, if it was not for the fact that they were engaged in the work of God, serving the people, ministering to the people, would have been called a violation of the Sabbath. But Jesus said that they were blameless. So Jesus authorized or validated that to minister to the spiritual needs of the people of the church and to see that their needs are met is not a violation of God's law. Principle number seven. Well, this goes, it's preparation, but it's the day before the Sabbath, but it is a principle that's related to the Sabbath because the principle is we have to do certain things to prepare for the Sabbath so that on the Sabbath we're not inundated with those things um, that we think we should be doing. So we do, as, we do our heavy lifting on preparation day. We prepare our meals on preparation day. We cut our lawns, wash our cars, do all these other things, preparation day. So when Sabbath day comes, comes, comes along, we can rest. We can rest. We don't have clothes to iron. We don't have laundry to do. And if we do, they will remain unironed and unlaundered because it's the seventh day. It's the day of rest. Don't fill the holy day with the mundane things of life. Shopping, cleaning, laundry, changing the spark plugs on your car. <laughs> when the Sabbath day comes along, God has authorized you a day off. Take it and enjoy it. <laughs> so here's the last principle. Doing God's good pleasure. Isaiah 58, verse 13 and 14 says, If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, not finding your own pleasure, not speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. You see, there is something more pleasurable that God has for us than we can even imagine or try to attain and receive for ourselves. You see, it doesn't mean that God doesn't want you to uh, feel pleasure on the Sabbath, but what he's getting at here is that he would rather that we learn to more greatly take delight in the spiritual activities and receive the pleasures that come from him. And these things will strengthen us and strengthen our, strengthen our relationship with God. And it also strengthens our relationship with one another. Because as we come together, blessing the Lord on his holy day, he in turn smiles upon his people, knowing that they are being renewed regenerated, revived, and prepared to continue in their life of service to him. Sabbath is a day to honor God as the creator and the sustainer of the world. To honor his holy day is to, in fact, honor him as the creator. And to not honor his holy day, in spite of what people say, is to deny 
that He is the creator of all things. People give lip service to God, but we want to give total service to Him. You see, He's preparing us for heaven. He is. God is, we're, this is the preparation room down here on this earth, and He's preparing us for heaven. And only those who are fit for heaven are going to enter in. I want to be there. I want to go to heaven. How about you? I want that to be my eternal home. I want that to be my final destination where we can live with God and enjoy the blessings of a life without sin, a life without a devil, a life without conflict, a life without pain, a life lived. For God, in the very presence of God. And in the sweet by and by, he's going to take us there. That's our closing song, by the way. 428, in the sweet by and by. Please stand and let's sing our closing song together. <clears throat> Loving Father in heaven, we thank you so much for giving us the blessings of this, your holy day, and for giving us the promise that one day, yes, for sure, in the sweet by and by, we will meet for a place where we will enjoy the eternal blessings of, e of eternity, and eternity, Lord, with you, away from the cares of this life, away from the pain and suffering and all the challenges that we're confronted with daily. Lord, we are so thankful that you have given us this promise and we can enjoy an oasis in time even down here with the blessings of your Sabbath where we come apart and lay aside the normal activities where we cease our striving to make ends meet, 
And we come to you who is the provider of all things, the creator of all things, knowing that as we rest in you, you renew us. You give us, Lord, uh, completeness, wholeness. Thank you for the blessings of your holy day. Now, Lord, we ask above everything that what we do today would honor you and glorify you, that families would be drawn closer together. Mothers and fathers would be drawn closer together. Pa parents and children would be drawn closer together. And that your church would be drawn closer together. Closer together, Lord, because we're drawing closer to you. Bless us today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you and have a blessed and happy Sabbath. You may be seated. The deacons will dis uh, dismiss you.